Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Oh, Lord. (laughs) I don't know where that pain came from. Man, I went down like a seven-year-old there, (laughs) sir. That's next year. Father, we just approach the throne of grace and thank you for your kindness, love, and mercy and grace. We thank you that we can boldly approach it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we haven't come into the house of God to hear from a man or or a woman. We have come into the house of God to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. Now, Lord, about all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, as you would bless us, we would ask that you bless them also. They're our brothers and our sisters, Lord. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodist Episcopalian Charismatics. Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley, Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God, the Well, the Way. We thank you for Trinity Emmanuel Baptist Ecclesia Church. Lord, bless them. Bless our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters. Lord, bless them as you would bless us. And we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name and the great big shout, we all say Amen. Amen. A time for celebration. A lot of times we don't understand that God really cares about us celebrating. In fact, it's just simply as this. It's the will of God. In fact, I want to just share something with you. If you really study the scripture, you'll find in the Old Testament that tithing really wasn't 10%, but it was really 23%. And here's how it works. It's really kind of crazy. 10% went to the priesthood in order to do the work of the ministry. 10% was set aside for pleasures of that family. Did you know that? And another 3% went for the government and the facilities to manage everything. And so that really wasn't a 10% like a lot of people think. It was really more more than that. But I like the 10% that's set aside because God cares about what the family does, what people do. They didn't go on vacations like you and I do. They didn't get in their car and drive up the coast and eat at a restaurant overlooking the ocean or spend the night at a hotel down at Disneyland. They didn't get to do those kinds of things. But God cared about them having some pleasure, whatever it was, and had the finances for those pleasures. God cares about celebration. You know, the Lord knows a lot about you and I, more about you and I than we know about ourselves. He knows that we're a people that oftentimes forget about what God has done in our life. And he calls for a feast, if you will. The feasts of Israel were really quite interesting. There were so many of them. They happened all the time on a monthly basis, on a bi-monthly basis. There were just many of them. And God's given me four to show you some interesting things about the feasts of the Old Testament. May I say this before I show you anything? Is that remember that the Old Testament were physical principles that were physical that show a spiritual insight today. So what took place in the physical story in the Old Testament is a spiritual truth that we're to hold on to today. For an example, the physical truth ability of Israel to leave Egypt and to go into the promised land, which we're going to talk about just in a few minutes, is exactly the spiritual concept is for us in the New Testament is that we have left the bondage of this world and of the devil and we're now going into the things of God. There's a future ahead of us and every one of us in here have our own personal promised land that God wants to develop and bring forth in our lives wants to take us somewhere. And so it's a biblical principle that the Old Testament is simply a physical action of what the spiritual principle is that we're to grab a hold of in our hearts that help us with our relationship with God in the New Testament. And I just wanted to share as there are so many feasts, and the word feast is an interesting word. 
It means this, and I'm going to pop it up on the overhead for you. It's a congregational time, listen to this, for a festival. <laughs> I thought that was wild, a festival. I mean, a festival to me is like party, food, celebration, excitement, friends, joy. All of that at one time. Here's this, here's this God in heaven that knows we have a tendency to get so religious that we kind of like get stale and we get, you know, without any joy and happiness in our life. And he's now telling us that the congregation needs to come together in a special time and have a festival, a special time to celebrate. And I use this word, very important word, and remember. There was a reason, not only that we needed as human beings to let off the steam and be excited about something, but we needed to remember something. Because God knows we humans have a tendency to forget. I remember one person who stood and gave testimony of the great things that God had done in his life. And how God had opened a door and he could buy a home he never thought in a million years he would ever have. They got down him and his wife on their knees and asked God to bless them with this home. And God opened it up and gave them this great house. And he came to the church and he gave great testimony. Within one year, he had completely forgotten. Within one year, he was out of the church. We so easily forget about the good things that God has done and is doing in our lives that God wanted these festivals, these times, if you will, of, uh, uh, of uh, special feasts, uh, these celebration times that we would celebrate who God was and what God's done in our life, and it kept the things of God before us on a regular basis. Let me say it again. It kept the things that God has done for us on a regular basis so that we don't end up like others, forgetting what God has done for us. And that's what a festival, that's what, a, that's what the feast that God would have for us to remember on a, a regular basis. Let me just say it like this. Someone came along recently and confronted me at the back door as I was greeting people. He, he started to say some things about the Christmas trees that were up. And I could tell he was angry and I could tell he was wanting me to listen to what he had to say. Uh, I, you know, I kind of get old as I am I old sometimes. You know, I get a little cranky, I guess, you know. And, uh, and quite frankly, I don't know if it's cranky or if I just passed the age of really giving a flip what anybody thinks. <laughs> and I could tell the guy was really having a hard time coming to this church because of Christmas trees. You see, Christmas tree used to be a sign of a cult in the fertility god of that particular cult. And then it was taken by a Christian church and it was turned around and the evergreen church was there as a symbol of the evergreen itself, of the uh, everlasting commitments and promises of God's word and everlasting life. And the evergreen church represented that. And then, of course, we brought into the picture the very birth of Christ. A lot of times what happens is we get so religious we're tied up in the wrong, not seeing the good. And we get so tied up in the, you know, the religious way of doing things, we forget to let it out, relax a little bit, take a deep breath. I love it in this day and age, the words chill, just kind of cruise a little bit and let it happen. And all of a sudden, this guy was just getting up tight. And, and I asked him, I said, first of all, do you go to this church? And he says, well, this is my first time. I said, okay. And you want me to change the whole church because you just walked in. You want me to change everything. See, what we're doing is we're lifting up Jesus during this time of year. Have you noticed how the world is using less and less of the name of Jesus? It's no longer Christmas, it's Xmas. It's no longer allowed, it's a holiday. It's not a Christmas holiday at, at school. It's a holiday holiday, or they call it a winter holiday. And all of a sudden, Jesus is out of there all the time. And if anybody ought to lift up and keep the name of Jesus, don't you think it ought to be the church? 
And in order for that to happen, don't you think that we ought to learn something about celebration? That, that there's feasts that God wants us to remember and not forget about who he is and what he has done for each and every one of us in here? And when we gather together this coming Friday night, to all the ladies that are going to be in this place, I hope you're here on time because the introduction is bizarre, mind-boggling, and the exit is even as great, if not more exciting. And you need to be on time because it's a time of celebration of the birth of the King of glory. The one who came and poured out his life for a people like us who didn't deserve anything. But he loved us so much that he laid his life down and died for us. In other words, he saw you and saw me as very valuable. And we ought to celebrate about who he is. And really, that's what this is all about, is preparing you a time for celebration. I want to look at four of the feasts, if I may. And I'm going to give you the kind of the time schedule when they happened, uh, which is really interesting. The uh, Jewish calendar is different than our calendar, if you, if you probably already know that. But if you don't know that, uh, January is our first of the year, first month in the year. But in Jewish calendar, April is the first month of the year, which is probably, and I can't say this for sure, probably around the time that Jesus was really born. We just celebrate the birth on, on December 25th because that's a time uh, when the world needs to know that the King is glo of glory is, is born on this planet for each and every one of us. And we took advantage of that hundreds and even thousands of years ago. So you will find that I'm going to give you some feasts and what they meant because symbolically, the Old Testament, remember, is speaking about spiritual truths in the New Testament. Did you get that? So when God came along and said, I have a feast for you of this particular type, it was really saying something about how you and I together today ought to worship the Lord and celebrate with remembrance of what he has done for us today. In other words, don't just come into the room and think that's all this is about. It's really about a celebration of what God has done, what more, because it reminds us about the great things that he's done and the great things he's gonna continue to do in our lives. Does anybody understand that? And the first one I wanted to share with you, there's a ton of them, but I felt like God just jumped out at the page at four of them for me tonight. And the first one's a feast of Passover. Took place on the 14th day of April, which, remember, is the first of the year from the Jewish calendar. And the example of, of Passover is an interesting example. And what it says to all of us is so much. In other words, here's this celebration, here's this feast of Passover. And most people don't understand even what it symbolically meant. Here's what it means, literally, that you'll find that Israel was in captivity for hundreds of years to the Egyptians, and they were slaves. Do you remember the story? And they were in bondage, and here comes Moses, and Moses is going before Pharaoh as he's anointed by God to talk to Pharaoh about letting God's people go. Pharaoh is not about to do it. He's an arrogant, pompous man. He doesn't want anything to do with this uh, Israeli, Israeli God. He doesn't want anything to do with the Hebrew God. He doesn't want anything to do with it at all. Doesn't believe in any of that. He's got his own gods, has his own thing. And the Bible says that his heart was hardened. In other words, he just put up a fight against the things that Moses was requesting of him. You remember, you've seen the movie, so I know you know the story. And you'll find that literally what takes place is that the children of Israel uh, have all of these plagues that are on their behalf coming against Pharaoh, softening his heart to let the children of Israel go. The very last plague that comes, and I think it's about Exodus, the 12th chapter, is, if you will, is the plague that the firstborn child, male and female, firstborn, of male or female of the human race as well as every animal that's on the planet that is going to die. There's a, if you will, a angel of death that's going to come through the camps of Israel, come through the camps of Egypt, and every firstborn child is going to die. And the only way that Israel could escape that is an interesting way. 
they had to take the blood of a lamb that was properly positioned and proper for sacrifice, a spotless lamb. Now the idea here is, this is obviously, is Jesus without sin. And the blood of that lamb had to be placed on the doorstep and on the door covering of the house. So when the spirit of death came through, the angel of death came through, he saw that in that house, the blood was there and the blood protected those people from death. And it's called Passover because then this, if you will, angel of death passed over that house and went to a house that didn't have the blood on it. You say, well, wow, what a wild story. It's the story of Jesus. And listen to what I'm going to say to you. Why is it symbolic? Why is it important for us? Why should we celebrate such a thing? And I'm not saying we stop and we celebrate Passover itself. Here's how we celebrate as Christians. It's called Easter. And it's called the resurrection, and it's called salvation, and it's called eternal life, all because of the shed blood that's on our house by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was just a picture in the past of what is reality, the truth today. And if you never had anything else to celebrate, and you're born of the Spirit of God, and if you're not, we'll take care of that before the night's over. But if you're born of the Spirit of God, and, ne- and you had nothing else to celebrate this, this holiday season, you ought to celebrate because, guess what? You have eternal life because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that in itself is so exciting. I like what Peter says. Go with, in fact, I'll pop it up on the overhead. It's so cool. First Peter, the first chapter, verse number three, says it like this. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his, and I love this, abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living or lively, one translation says, a living hope. In other words, I have a hope that's not dead. I don't have a hope that goes nowhere. I've got a hope that is alive. It is lively. It is living hope. Through what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Man, I have got salvation because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. It's the last, listen, the spirit of Uh, uh, of death has passed over my house. And if you're born of the Spirit of God, you're going to live forever. And that's worth celebrating. Come on, somebody. (laughs) We're in a celebration mode this whole month, celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The second thing I wanted to point out that God spoke to me about was a feast of uh, uh, of, um, Pentecost. A lot of times we think Pentecost is a New Testament word, but the Feast of Pentecost was a, was a feast that was hundreds of years established uh, way before this particular time, even thousands of years before this particular time that we know it and see it in the New Testament. The Feast of Pentecost was in the third month, June. And what it really meant, it was held at the end of the wheat harvest. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but wheat is a symbol of the stability of life. In fact, you'll find that oftentimes. Where there was wheat, the people knew they were going to live for another year. You and I don't even think in those kinds of terms at all. If we want wheat, we go buy it. You want wheat, you get it in your bread. You want wheat, you go to the store. You don't have any idea what goes on in the rest of the world in order to produce the wheat. But in those days, may I say this to you, wheat was a symbol of a stable life. And when you had wheat, you got to live. You got to be filled with the pleasures of life. Wheat was not only economically filling, but it was spiritually filling, and it was physically filling. And you were filled, if you will, because of the wheat that you had. And at the end of June, you will find that there's this this great uh, feast that God says it's time to celebrate because now the wheat is coming in and you will be filled. And they would see this wheat and they would thank God for it because now they have another season of being filled. And it was called Pentecost. Wow. I never knew that someone might say. But remember Acts, the second chapter, verse number one. I'll just pop it up on the overhead for you. In verse number one, it says, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, 
They were all in one accord in one place. Verse number two. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I love this. I love the words, filled the whole house. Wow, verse number three. And it says, and there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each one of them. And verse number four, and listen to these words. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, Pentecost means a filling. And can you get any fuller than you can get when you get God? Because in a relationship with God, the fullest you're going to get is when the Holy Ghost gets down on the inside of you and he fills you. They were all filled and they spoke in tongues. My goodness, my friends, it's so important for us to see that this is so important for us because it's the staple of life. And we celebrate Pentecost. And every day we ought to be excited because you know why? Because we've got the Holy Ghost on the inside of us. I don't have to face tomorrow alone. I don't have to face tomorrow not knowing what's going on. If I don't know how to make it, God that lives on the inside of me, he knows how to make it. If I don't know where I'm going, he can show me. He can give me direction. He's the best GPS system there's ever been for mankind. It's the Holy Ghost that fills you when you get God on the inside of you. And it's time to celebrate the very fact that we're together and we're filled with the things of God and God wants us to have a, can I just say it like this? A lot of people don't like this word, but I don't care. There's, you gotta hear it. God wants us to have a party when we gather together because God has done great and mighty marvelous things. Come on, somebody. The third thing, and I love this, we're talking about these wonderful Jewish feasts that were before us so that we can get an idea of what's going on and how we should celebrate today. The Feast of the Trumpets. Trumpets were blown and the people would come. It would take place usually in the seventh month, which is October in the Jewish calendar. And it was so fascinating because it would gather the people. And what they would do is the priest would go down to the Pool of Shalom, which is in, if you will, in Jerusalem. Deborah and I have been there. In the pool, they would gather, they would take water out of the pool, and they would take the water to the temple, and there in the, on the altar of the temple, they would put the water and dump it all over, saying something to God. God, we need a great raining season so that we can have more of a crop next year. In other words, they were asking God for one more year. And what a celebration it was. The people, the horns would sound. The people would eat. They would bring their fatted animals. They would, they would party and celebrate that God was going to answer their prayers and get more rain during winter that they needed in order to have a great harvest that spring. What a thing that we have. Every time we gather together, the water oftentimes for us means the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit means something greater for every one of us. It really means a greater relationship with God, a greater relationship with Jesus, all because that water symbolized something for us. Because when you have a great relationship with Jesus, you have a great harvest in your future. And let me say this, each and every month and year of your life. And it's all based on your great relationship with Jesus that's all based on your anointing by God from the Holy Spirit. And God is making a statement here on this Feast of the Trumpets. In John the 10th chapter, in verse number nine, let's just pop it up on the overhead. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, listen to this, there's no other way to enter but by him. He will be saved, and I will go in and out and find, and this is funny the word, you're going to find something. Notice what you're going to find. What is it? Pastures. Where did that come from? Because we're all sheep, and we're going to find the pastures. We're going to find the life, going to find the fulfillment. I don't know where you're at tonight, but if you're looking for a life of fulfillment, you're going to find it only in Christ Jesus. 
And he makes it very clear in verse number 10. He says these words. He says, the thief does not come. You know who the thief is. Except to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life. And that you may have it more abundantly. And that's what the relationship with Jesus is all about. Verse number 11. I love these words. He says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Didn't Jesus give us his life? Today we carry the life of God on the inside of us. Oh, somebody ought to give me a great... That is worth celebration. That is worth a shout. That is worth a dance. That is worth a hand clap. That is worth your lifting your heart. That's worth lifting your hands. That's lift, lifting your voice. That's because it's a great relationship with Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. The fourth thing that God gave me to give to you, and I love this one, it's my favorite of all of them, the Feast of Dedication. It's a deep re-consecration of the temple. And it's a feast that they gather together so everybody would consecrate themselves once again. And someone might say to me, well, why do you have to consecrate yourself once again? Did you know that every day the world sucks a little bit of God's life out of you? And sometimes you need to get someplace to get more of God's life in you. And there's not a thing wrong with saying, God, here I am. And where I was last year is not where I'm going to be in the future. And I'm getting greater in you. And I'm getting bigger in you. And you're getting bigger in me and greater in me. And Lord, I'm making a whole heart commitment. What I had committed to you last year was great, but this year I'm making a greater commitment. And you know what? It doesn't mean you're getting saved again. You're already saved. It just means the relationship is deep. That means that re-consecration of the temple was very important. In other words, it's a recommitment that says, God, I made a commitment, but I'm making, I'm refreshing my own thinking about where I'm at. You know, sometimes we just go and we get bored out and we get forgetful and we forgot about where we came from. We forgot about what we were like. We forgot about the excitement when we first got saved. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? We were thrilled, we were hungry, we went to church all the time. And then all of a sudden over the years, we start weaning from that. We start getting away from that. We need to make a re-consecration of our heart to God on a regular basis. And there's not a thing in the world wrong with that. And I love what it says in the word of the Lord. And it says this in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse number one. New Testament now, talking to every one of you. He says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Man, that's called re-consecration. That means all of a sudden, Lord, he's talking to who? People that are born again. You would think, well, I'm born again. Is there more? Oh, yes. There's always more of God, and there's always more of you you can give of God because where you were at last year, you thought you gave it all, but this year, you know there's some parts that also need to be given. It doesn't mean you're not saved. You're saved, but you're getting deeper. Hear me now. You're getting deeper. Hear me now. You're getting deeper in the things of God. You can't stay the way you were. You've got to keep getting deeper. And he he had this, if you will, a, a, a feast of rededication. Wow. Where they got together and every year they celebrated God and they celebrated their commitment. And they said, we're going to recommit. We're up here. We're going in. We've already done a year with you. We're doing two more. We're doing three more. We're doing five more. We're doing the rest of our life until it's the end of our life. Somebody listening to what I'm saying? There are four things that we could celebrate. Number one, we are saved. Number two, we are filled. Number three, we are in relationship with God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And number four, we are re-consecrated to God. Four simple things tonight that you and I need to major in in every area of our life. How about some of you that are in here tonight? You know your relationship with God is not as good as it used to be. And you need to make a re-consecration. And you need to celebrate it. Some of you need to make a brand new 
commitment to God by getting saved, getting filled with the Holy Ghost, having a spiritual relationship with God. That's what he's talking about. It's a place of, if I may say this, listen closely, of celebration. It's a party. And God wants you to party. I don't know if you know this or not. This is not new to Deborah and I. When we designed this church, in fact, Deborah designed this church, she designed it 15 years ago with that courtyard as a place for parties, for celebration of Jesus, where the congregation could get together. This is not new for us. It might be new for you, but it's not new for us. And when you come into this house and you see that courtyard, that's a courtyard that says, here, we're Christians. And we're not all bummed out and religious, stuffy, and don't live the life that God would have us live. We celebrate the goodness of God and the things of God. Come on, somebody. And that's what that courtyard is saying every time we come into the house of God. It's there to celebrate the goodness of God. You ought to give the Lord a great big praise tonight. So when people come up and say, you go to a church that has a Christmas tree? Yep. (laughs) Because we're not celebrating some fertility God. We're celebrating the King of glory and his birth. That's what this is all about. And we're not joining the ranks of putting down the name of Jesus this time of year. We're joining the minority that's lifting up the name of Jesus. That's what this is all about. And we're being prepared this entire month of December is a month of celebration of Jesus. And every time we come into the house of God, we're going to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he is worthy. He is the king of glory, and he's worthy of our shout. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our dance. He's worthy of our expression. He is the king of glory. And that's what this is all about and why we come into the house of God. We are celebrating Jesus. If that's okay with you, then give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't that good? Just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. Is that okay? I don't want anybody to ever come into the house of God and and not have an opportunity to give their heart and life to Jesus. You know... We talked about celebration. Maybe some of you don't feel like you could really celebrate Jesus. Maybe you don't feel that way because, or do feel that way because you, you know, you have maybe head knowledge of Jesus instead of heart relationship. What I mean by head knowledge is everybody knows who Jesus is. We celebrate Christmas every year. We celebrate Easter every year. But you know, having a head experience with who Jesus is doesn't get you to heaven. No, what gets you to heaven is your heart. And the question is, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? That's a question everybody ought to answer right now in this church. Are you gonna go to heaven? Are you gonna go to hell? And some of your answer is, well, I hope I'm gonna make it to heaven. Guess what, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere, nowhere does it say you can hope your way into heaven. It's not there. Some of you said, well, I'm pretty good. I'm going to get to heaven because I'm good. Guess what? Nowhere does it say because you're pretty good or good, you get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Some of you said, well, you know, I've always thought of myself as a Christian. I guess I am a Christian. You know, I'm not Jewish. I'm not a Muslim, a Hindu, or Buddhist. I guess I'm Christian. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible it says because you're not some other religion here. You're born in America that you get to go to heaven and have eternal life. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You can't get to heaven because you think or hope you're going to make it. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't make it any other way but his way. You can't make it by some well-meaning church committee's way. You can't make it by my way or your way. you got to make it by God's way. And Jesus tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the Bible. John 3rd chapter, he says these words, You must be born again. 
And I know as soon as I use the words born again, everybody kind of like turns off because Hollywood's done a great job on making born again people look like idiots. But that's not what he's talking about. Born again means something. Most people don't know what it means. But I'm going to tell you what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what born again means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. All or nothing, I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, you've heard of it. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, and when I come, and you know he is, he says, and when I come again, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really, really just said? He said, people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're gonna get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Let me now define for you what lukewarm is. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out. Little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, you're not against God. Oh, no, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's the difference. God is something in your life. Oh, watch this. He's surely something, but he's not everything. That's the difference. Lukewarm. And you're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus according to what his own words are. And somebody tonight is standing in front of you. This is a divine appointment you have with God to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life so that you can celebrate the rest of your life for what God has done for you and what he's going to do for you. And tonight is your night of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, well, how do, how do I get right with God? Well, you got to get right with God God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In other words, in a moment, I'm going to count to three like this. I'll go one, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together on this Bible. I'll go bang. That's the sound you'll hear. Bang. When you hear that sound, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down. What you're saying by raising your hand is I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to give God all of my heart, give God all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up and you can put it right back down. That's simple. You say, Pastor Jim, is that simple? Yeah, I won't embarrass you, but even if you are embarrassed because you raised your hand, it's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, tonight is your night of salvation. God brought you here for a reason. It's time, it's time, listen to me, it's time to give him all of your heart. It's time to give him all of your life. And for some of you, I'm talking about all of it. For the first time, you're gonna give it to him, all of your heart and life. Some of you need to make a rededication of your life because you've been walking on both sides of the fence so long, you don't even know what side is God's anymore. And now you need to make a commitment of all of your heart and life. And tonight is your night. In a moment when I count to three and pop my hands on this Bible like that, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, never given him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are not sure, my goodness, don't sit there and do nothing. Make sure. You're saying to yourself, I'm not sure. I prayed with Billy Graham. I prayed at Harvest Crusade, but I'm really not sure where I'm at with God. Well, tonight, make sure. Just get your hand up in a moment and give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. Come on, tonight, God brought you here for a reason. Tonight is your night of salvation. Tonight, get ready to celebrate Jesus for the rest of your life as a child of God. Man, that's good news. Sit there and do nothing and stare at me. But you made your choice because I told you the truth. And you're going to have to deal with God about it someday. Or get ready to put your hand up and give him all of your heart. Give him all of your life. I've done my job. Here it is. I'm counting to three. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Seven. Thank you. Back over here. There's eight. Right back over here. God bless you. Anybody else? There's eight. Anybody on this side? I didn't see anybody on this side. Thank you. There's nine. God bless you. Anybody else? Where are you? Ten. 
Anybody else need to get your hand up? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's nine. There's another one in the family room. Oh, right back there. Ten. God bless you. Anybody else? There's ten wise people. Where's eleven wise people? Where's the number eleven? You know you need to get your hand up. Don't waste another moment. Get your hand up. Where are you, number eleven? Where are you, number eleven? I already saw your hand. Thank you. God bless you. Skip number 11. Let's jump over. Where are you, number 12? <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for at least 10 people. So good, so good. Here's what I want you to do, all 10 of you. Nobody leave during this period of time. It's real rude when the Holy Spirit's drawing people forward and you walk that way when you're going this way. Just stay in your seat for a moment and I'll let you go in just a few moments. Here's what I want you to do. All 10 of you, plus 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, wherever you're at, you know you need to give God all of your heart. Even though you didn't raise your hand, why don't you get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. We need to pray together and to invite Jesus into our hearts. And I want all of you to raise your hand. You're serious about God. Get out of your seat. Get down here right now. Bring your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come. Come on. 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 Is a strong and mighty tower. Come on, come on, come your name is a shelter like no other. Your name. Come on, bring a friend if you need to. Get down here. Sing along. There's nothing else in power to say like your name. Come on, you come too. Come on. It's a shelter like Oh, well, they're still coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on, you come too. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. It's your name. Let the nation sing louder. Okay, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. You're not going to the morgue. You're going to heaven. <laughs> so we want to be excited about that. I want you to look to your left. Here's Joel Alvarado. He's the guy I was telling you about that likes those breakfast burritos. And so anyway, Joel's going to pray with you. Only takes a few moments. He'll tell you about a great program we have. Get involved in it. It'll really help you to get strong in the things of Jesus. In other words, we don't want you to go and fall through the cracks. Go back doing what you used to do. want to help you keep on going forward for God. So tonight's a great step. Tonight you're going to get into the kingdom. But then what to do? He'll give you some information. It'll help you. And it uh, only takes a few moments. People you came with, they'll wait for you. So make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel. Right over that way. Come on. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.